the book is called Neoliberalism's Demons. Maybe you've noticed that in the publicity for the event. Um, and for probably most of you know, neoliberalism is a term that scholars and journalists and even politicians use to kind of um, describe a particular configuration of capitalism after 1973, um, as well as the ideology of that configuration. And that means sort of in the most maybe condensed form, the subordination of the state to the market, and then sort of attendant um, privatization, austerity, the evisceration of the welfare state um, and of public institutions, and the upward transfer of wealth. So Adam's book explores in particular kind of um, how this privatization prompts a spiritual and uh, psychic crisis in which individuals are made morally responsible for their own economic status and then have lots of kind of attendant uh, anxiety and shame and they bear these strong assignations of blame um, in a manner akin to demonization. So in many ways, the book is kind of this story of a personal framework that then accompanies the pri structural privatization of formerly public services and public goods and public responsibilities. And the first sentence of the book really winks at this personalization and privatization. The sentence is, every academic critique of neoliberalism is an unacknowledged memoir. Then, you don't go on to elaborate quite exactly what that might mean in your case. Of course, um, the literary people in the audience might uh, think about how memoir is the preeminent genre of neoliberalism, right? It is our best-selling genre, um, and we're witnessing all kinds of memoirization of fiction and so on. But I actually um, do want to ask you about the personal memoir-like quality of this book. You kind of um, poignantly, but really only parenthetically, insert yourself uh, at a few junctures. On page 96, you indicate um, you know, that you are a person who has known nothing but the neoliberal order for your entire life. Um, and one of the things I think is generally so compelling about all of your work, your other books, and your kind of public presence um, is how personal you can be in your prominent academic blogging, in your recent N plus one piece about uh, familial support for fascism, um, and so, and you're drawing on growing up in Flint, Michigan. So I just want to sort of ask you if you could start off by acknowledging the memoir part of this book, right? Um, what is the really personal dimension of this? And, um, and how do you want to think about that blend of um, the philosophical, the theological, the political, economic, and the personal? Yeah, I mean, of course, I couldn't acknowledge it directly in the text, or else I would defraud, you know, my first sentence of the book. <laughs> um, but I can acknowledge it here since this is outside the text. Um, yeah, I think a big part of it is um, I grew up in Flint, Michigan. Um, I think we're all familiar with their water situation now. Um, for most of my life, they've been most famous for the fact that um, factories are constantly closing there. Um, they finally have run out. Um, so that now that they've run out of factories to close, now they're like poisoning the water. Um, and I view it as basically um, ground zero of neoliberalization in, in America in terms of the attack on um, the industrial plant of America and specifically because Flint was such um, a center for the union movement and the workers movement in the US. I think that there's a reason that Flint is now a bombed out shell of a city, which is to um, basically punish um, labor unions from beyond the grave. And in terms of the, the shame and stuff like that that you were talking about, if you talk to people in Flint, they do feel ashamed that this has happened to them. And they feel ashamed, like, well, the unions did, did good and they were necessary in their time, but then they overreached and then they caused this to happen to us. They caused us to be abandoned. Um, and um, I recall uh, when I was a kid, I went to the, uh, the Sloan Museum in Flint. It's like a local history museum. And they had like a bunch of stuff about the labor movement. And the last thing that had happened in Flint was that Michael Moore had made Roger at V, um, which they all hated uh, because they thought it was trying to bring shame on the city. Like everybody in Flint hates Rod, uh, Michael Moore. Um, it's the memoiristic thing. Like sometimes I start to almost think like this is a conspiracy. 
I was born in 1980, which is the same year, obviously, Reagan was elected president and neoliberalization became irrevocable in the US. Also the same year that Roger Smith of Roger and Me became the CEO of, of GM and started like dismantling like my world around me. Um, and so I feel in a way as though I have been just like narrowly escaping being destroyed by neoliberalism at every step of the way. Um, like had I not you know, gone away to college, had I not, you know, you know who knows what would have, what would have happened. I mean, my life was also almost uh, ruined by the financial crisis because I graduated with my PhD right as it was happening and jobs that I had like interviews for and stuff were, compl were just pulled. They just no longer existed. It wasn't that I didn't get them, they just didn't exist, mm -hmm. which is a really scary and upsetting thing, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and ironically, I uh, made ends meet during grad school and, and after um, by working in an ancillary way for the financial sector. Um, I was writing um, uh, like results of mutual funds or something for investors. Probably nobody has ever read a single word of those reports that I read, that I wrote, but it's also like what I've gotten paid the most for, which is insane. <laughs> um, so this is something that I, that it is a deeply personal issue for me. Um, and like when people say that neoliberalism isn't a real thing or it was just made up to discredit Hillary Clinton or something like that, I become viscerally angry because I'm like, no, it's real and it has had hugely destructive effects and your denialism is offensive. Yeah. Do you, um, is it pushing if I ask, I mean, one of the other things that you sometimes blog about and write about and tweet about um, is indeed the um, student debt and the um, precaritization of academic employment. Um, so you have these job interview cancellations, you have um, a wonderful job that is also a somewhat marginal or contingent job and has gone through its own versions of structural adjustment. Um, so I just wonder if you um, want to say anything about um, the trajectory of um, your career in the university in this neoliberal arc or um, how you, if you even want to talk about the crises of anxiety that um, you're kind of charting in this broader structural sense for yourself personally. I think that there's a reason that the university has been such a target for neoliberalization and it's not simply that it's a public good or that it seems like it's something that needs to be retooled to be more profitable. I think there's something in academic culture itself that has an elective affinity with um, neoliberalism. There's this deep-seated belief in meritocracy, uh, working hard, the people who, who work hardest and do the best work are rewarded. We all know in our hearts that this is not true and this is not how it ever worked and it works in like less and less like that every day. But I think that you don't go into academia unless you do believe the myth to a certain extent. And I think this is another area where um, shame comes in, um, where um, people who are forced to leave academia for their financial su survival, for their mental health, I think many of them feel ashamed um, and sometimes this turns into kind of like an anti-intellectual resentment. Um, I've seen that happen. I can understand why it happens. Um, in my case, um, I believe that I have done a lot of work that is worthy of recognition. Um, but I know that I did not get what I've gotten because I deserved it uniquely. Um, when I got my first job, which was a visiting position at Kalamazoo College, a very nice school, a nice position. I didn't have too like high of a, a teaching load. Like there, it was just really nice. They took care of me nicely. Um, it, was, it was a great way to start off. Um, I didn't get it because I like interviewed and went through a competitive process. I do it because I had, like I had a friend of a friend and they needed somebody at the last minute. And this is what happened. Um, and similarly, I would have never known about the job at Scheimer College had I not just asked on my blog, like, are there jobs in Chicago that I've overlooked? I never would have heard of the school. I never would have gotten this job. Um, and even now, you know, I'm like continuing on to North Central College due to circumstances beyond my control, which is that North Central has made um, a very generous and unexpected gesture of taking us on. Um, 
and that has resulted in a lot of cool things happening and me making a lot of new friends and teaching in new, new and challenging environments, but it also has downgraded my academic status because I am now visiting again. Yeah. I specifically ask introducers not to mention that because I'm ashamed of it, uh, even though it, has, it doesn't reflect on me at all. It's just a fluke occurrence. Um, and like I've written a whole book on neoliberalism and yet my gut reactions are still determined by this. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's what's powerful about the book, right? That um, these f feelings of shame and anxiety and this kind of crisis sense of economic insecurity that you um, situate as part of this larger logic of blame and blameworthiness, right? Um, and that's part of what um, is what you think theology contributes to understanding economic history and economic culture and economic ideology. I wondered, um, since we've had that then personal foray, as it were, at the beginning, if we could take a step back to um, just some kind of quick and dirty sense of like what is political theology since that's the subfield of the discipline that you're trained in of theology mm -hmm. um, uh, so what are the questions it asks and answers and then um, the book expresses a lot of wish that political theology do much more than it has and mm -hmm. that it overcome um, indeed some of its right-wing origins and um, become a masterful complement or supersession of the Marxist analyses of neoliberalism right so um, so what is what does political theology do and what do you want it to do um, traditionally um, since it was founded in the early 20s by Carl Schmitt, um, well known to be a Nazi legal theorist, um, it is focused on basically, I would say, three different key areas. Um, one is just the recognition that there seems to be um, a weird, non-coincidental number of analogies between political and theological concepts. Um, that at any given historical moment, you can find that theological systems tend to mirror political systems. Um, and the biggest thing that Carl Schmitt was interested in was the analogy between God as the sovereign ruler of the cosmos and the king or president or whatever as the sovereign ruler of um, an earthly polity. Um, and so a lot of political theology has been like focused on the sovereignty problem. Um, and another aspect is like across history, um, Schmidt famously says that every um, important political concept is a secularized theological concept. And so that opened up the door to a lot of research into um, the transition from the medieval to the modern, from the Christian to the secular, that kind of thing, like the question of transition. Those are all very interesting topics. I've done a lot of thinking about them. Um, and I think that it's also much more limited um, than it could be. Um, I think that there are uh, theological parallels in a lot of areas of like governance broadly construed in the economic realm, things like this. Um, but Carl Schmitt like begins rolling over in his grave whenever anybody like uh, starts talking about the economic as though it's like important or legitimate or something like that. Um, I don't think it's bad for him to roll over at his grave. He was a terrible person, whatever. Um, and but I do use his concepts to kind of like uh, find a Schmidtian way out of Schmidt. Um, I kind of I feel like he's creating a broad category of political theology, which he then like narrows into his own like personal version immediately. And so I try to recover that broader version, which I take to be um, the study of structures of legitimacy in a broad sense. And I think that the root of these astounding parallels between politics and theology is that both political orders and theological systems are trying to grapple with the same unfixable problem. Um, on the political side, this is the problem of legitimacy. Why should you people be in charge? Why should society be like this? There is no final answer to that question. On the theological side, it's the, the problem of evil. Um, how can uh, you know, a benevolent, all-powerful God allow um, evil and suffering and injustice to exist? There's no final answer to that question.
And if even at this root level, you can see that they're kind of the same question, mm -hmm. that the problem of evil is asking, is God really legitimate? Does God deserve to be God? Does he deserve to be in charge if he lets all this happen? And what you know, challenges the legitimacy of a political order like you know, an unexpected catastrophe or like systemic injustice, things like that, that the problem of illegitimacy and the problem of evil are kind of, are the same problem fundamentally. And this is why we see the parallels that we do. And um, I think that a political theology that starts from this rather in like the, than in the kind of obscure corner that Schmidt wants us to start from is gonna have a much wider purchase and be able to do a lot more for us and not inadvertently turn us into Nazis. <laughs> the plus. Okay. Um, so I'm glad that you framed it that way because um, I did want to ask you about legitimacy. Um, this is the kind of mystery to me. Um, I, I mean, I, there's a, I think, even periodizing gesture that you make in the book to how um, popular Agamben's version of political theology became um, after 9-11. Um, and that certainly is the era that I was in graduate school. Um, and so it sort of was everywhere. Um, but one thing I never understood then, and I still feel like I don't fully understand in your um, argument here, is why legitimacy um, remains the, the question. So. Um, why is it so hard for us to tolerate or conceptualize contingency of our social relations and contingency of the historical path to what our current social and economic orders are? What kind of logics or what kinds of thinking, what kinds of stories do you need to be able to say, this government is illegitimate, but we are going to be on some kind of trajectory to greater legitimacy or to um, more uh, support for human flourishing or to have other standards besides legitimacy? So um, I guess the thing is like, what would be a social order that admitted effectively its own legitimacy, illegitimacy rather than um, resorting to the demonization and the kind of production of the specter of evil as the kind of, um, you know, uh, container ground for the illegitimacy? Um, you know, as a theologian, can you imagine like a genuinely secular state? Yes, I think that would actually be the goal. Um, like there are different forms of legitimacy uh, and I think we would need to like conceive a new form of legitimacy for um, an order that would be acceptable at this point. Um, the United States Constitution is legitimate in its own terms. It has been, it was ratified according to its own terms. It has been in continuous operation for X number of years. Um, people continue to consent to it. Um, although they're often confused by it. Um, just like, you know, the British monarchy is legitimate on its own terms, even though, again, people are very puzzled as to why these people should still be doing what they're doing. Um, and I think that, like, that kind of, um, kind of reified legitimacy is more, like, um, more analogous to, like, a very uh, dogmatic theological stance, you know, like this kind of like self-grounding, unquestionable uh, form of legitimacy. Um, and if I'm sending the message that I have and I have something in my back pocket that's going to fill that role, um, I have been misleading people inadvertently. <laughs> I think it just, but if you think about legitimacy in a less reified sense as like why people go along with things from the, on the day-to-day -day level, why, what hooks us into this order? I mean, what does the US Constitution have to do with us at all? It was made over 200 years ago in radically different circumstances by people that we probably wouldn't like approve of nowadays, um, even the best of them. Um, and I think that you ask questions about that, you're asking questions more about like soft power. Um, I think that why we need to talk about legitimacy is because no social order can function on pure physical coercion all the time. It would be impossible. It's even conceptually impossible. Like, how do you get the guards to consent to guard people? You know, like, um, there, there is something other than overt violence that happens that makes people basically go along with things um, and I think to understand why people do that, um, you need to start talking about legitimacy as a separable category from overt uh, coercive force. Um, 
I think that if we give up the idea of legitimacy, then we're just giving into a, a society where a vision of society that's just a war of all against all with no alternative to it. And I just don't find that appealing. <laughs> It's not appealing, but it may indeed be one of the places we're going in our crisis of legitimacy. Um, and, you know, it really felt like today we witnessed this kind of like yet another low of violent demonization of toddlers presenting themselves as a southern border for asylum, right? Um, so this logic of demonization, this malignant and nihilist castigation and assignation of blame um, to those who are you know, the, the unworthy. That seems like a kind of bottomless force now um, in our political culture. Um, and I wonder if the, the something more might be the enjoyment of that nihilism um, by, you know, at least the parties in power, and if not the, you know, um, resenting aspirants. So I guess I kind of wanted to ask you, I know that you acknowledge the election um, in 2016 in the book, and you say, like, I did, you know, I didn't quite have time to continue to track and I wanted to stop the analysis, but how, how do you feel about the book um, since the like, you know, naked enterprise of um, fascist nihilist violence has become just ever more apparent, which isn't to say, you know, massively quantitatively different, but massively more naked. Yeah, it's a, uh, I think that I haven't reconsidered like the, the main analysis in the book. I've been like obviously surprised and alarmed as all of us are by um, the the treatment of children in particular, and uh, that's one like I uh, have kind of a non-aggression pact with my parents, like I don't bring it up type of thing. Um, but when it comes to the issue of children and immigration, that's where I check in with them, and they're always like, "Whoa, holy crap." <laughs> I'm not sure what I signed myself up for. Like this is where they'll allow a chink to appear in the in this armor, uh, the armor of their defensiveness, of their resentment, of the fact that they would possibly suffer social consequences for their political choices, um, their desire to be right. Like these are not attractive qualities, but they're very human qualities that I think we can understand. Enjoying seeing that video is is something uh, beyond that. There is probably. Um, some portion of the U.S. Pol uh, um, population for whom like that kind of stuff is a feature, not a bug. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that for Trump personally, those kind of behaviors have a special appeal because they are so beyond the pale. Um, he seems to um, have the personality of an abuser who's just trying to like, or even like a cult leader, mm -hmm. who's just trying to get you to accept more and more and more. Um, and um, the number of people who, is, uh, who are willing to support him, I think, seems to be finite and hopefully dwindling, but it seems like the people who have gone all, all in on that are just not reachable. Um, I think that there, are, and this is a problem that is gonna be um, the case for the rest of our lives, um, that there are these people who have been profoundly morally damaged in a permanent way by Trump and they still get to vote, which sucks. <laughs> uh, um, so, well, okay, maybe I could use that, yeah, um, as a pivot to a question I want to ask you about psychoanalysis. Um, uh, because in um, so much of your work, and maybe even to come back around to this personal <coughs> dimension of shame and anxiety and then um, kind of rage and resentment and um, you are often kind of having your projects significantly informed by or even explicitly kind of engaging with psychoanalysis. Um, so I'm thinking of your first book which is um, an investigation of the theological kind of um, project uh, latent in the psychoanalytic philosopher Slavoj Žižek's kind of corpus um, and as well as your pop culture trilogy which um, is really kind of a tracking of the libidinal coordinates of contemporary um, television for the most part um, and the kind of psychosexual experience of neoliberalism so awkwardness and creepiness and sociopathy um, this book though uh, doesn't cite Sigmund Freud it doesn't cite Jacques Lacan there's a, f a couple of notes to Zizek um, one to Jody Dean maybe the psychoanalytic political theorist um, but it does seem that 
um, there are a number of the kind of insights of the argument that flow from psychoanalysis. Um, so I was just hoping that you might talk about um, that tradition's importance for you, um, its intersection with political theology, or its kind of purchase on political theory. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult thing. I, I seem to have kind of like um, two tracks in my mind. Like I have the psychoanalytic track, and I have the like political theological track, and it's just difficult for me to like explicitly thematize um, how they fit together in part because it feels kind of self-indulgent and like who cares um, who cares about me enough that they want to know this but you do we're close friends so uh, <laughs> and everybody came so I guess you do want to hear from me uh, I I think in terms of the project like the idea that political theology is responding to a, a, an unfixable problem like that's deeply psychoanalytic. That's what I understand psychoanalysis to be all about is our responses to unfixable problems. And I get that directly from my immersion in the work of Zizek. And I do um, give him credit for that and in the footnotes. Um, and I think that the concern for how does um, how does ideology or how does uh, the system of legitimacy hook us um, like that kind of is is very grounded in in Zizek's kind of project of cultural analysis um, what has kept me from explicitly foregrounding psychoanalysis um, in my more recent projects um, although for Kotzko completists <laughs> the second word, having a K, of course. Um, I do have an essay. Um, it's called something like, I, like it was originally called Why Agamben Needs Psychoanalysis, and it's like something involving psychoanalysis in my book co-authored with Colby Dickinson on um, Agamben's Coming Philosophy, um, where I do the whole devil project through psychoanalysis, and it becomes this whole tangled mess about the drives and like, it, like I just find it very difficult to um, to do that kind of analysis without getting kind of tangled up in this like Lacan scholasticism that um, has been done a lot by people who know Lacan better than me. Yeah. Um, and there has also been I've had a bit of a crisis of faith um, with Zizek himself given the tenor of his recent political interventions, which all seem to um, tend in a very objectively conservative direction, even though it's framed as like the true leftist answer should be this. Um, and it, that's been very difficult for me to understand what's happening um, and has made it less attractive for me to draw on Zizek for that reason. But the bigger reason, I think, is that I feel a greater, a greater fluency um, and purchase on the kind of political theological uh, text, primarily because of my background and um, disciplinary specialization. And for that reason, I feel like I have more creative work to do in the field um, of political theology than I do in psychoanalysis, like I worry that I would just be rehashing other stuff if I was doing it uh, via psychoanalysis, where I could, as I can do something new in political theology. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can fight about that later. Um, I think I'm going to ask one more question and then turn it over to you guys. Does that seem like okay, timing ways? Okay, great. So um, it's about um, the maybe positive term in the book, which is freedom. Um, you note that neoliberalism really sacralizes freedom, but that it has this like incredibly impoverished conception of what freedom is, right? The market-based competition for dominance. Um, and you conclude the book recommending that more work be done on the concept of freedom. So I guess I wanna ask you sort of like, 
to go out with a bang, like what is your richer definition of freedom that you could give us here? And does theology actually provide any of the terms that we would need, or do we need to look elsewhere? You reference, um, for instance, on page 48, Karl Marx's sense of the fundamental creativity of labor, but then there's sort of a counterbalance um, on 57 with Agamben's um, implication that the fullest potential of humanity must be um, found beyond necessity and beyond labor. Um, so is there a political theology or a Marxist <laughs> materialism of <coughs> creation? Can we have any more positive visions of human flourishing now that we face the prospect of extinction? <laughs> <laughs> Rot row. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I think, you know, um, an author that I've not studied closely, um, but I like a couple quotes from him that I use opportunistically, uh, is uh, Deleuze, <laughs> um, a great <laughs> philosopher. You should all study him carefully. Um, I have not done so. But he <laughs> once said that we know that um, creation is possible because capitalism happened. We know that something radically new can happen because capitalism happened. We made that happen. There was no inner necessity of, there was no like nature involved. It was, it was a human creation and we did it. Bad idea in retrospect, but at least we were trying something. That wasn't all the Deleuze quote. I, I started to paraphrase <laughs> after a certain portion. <laughs> um, and I think that like similarly, we know that social transformation is possible in modern countries because neoliberalism has transformed them. Um, we have lived that revolution for the last 40 years. Right, like Can whether there's any that? like uh, kind of resources or energy left to do anything else is unclear, but I think we do know that it's possible. In terms, and I think that um, it's very difficult to me, for me to imagine a political agenda in the modern world that was anti-freedom. So we kind of have to reclaim that floating signifier um, for ourselves. In the end of the book, I, um, I talk a lot about, well, maybe a little about, because um, it's a short conclusion, that we need to start thinking in terms of collective freedom, which from a neoliberal perspective and for many Americans, probably a common sense perspective is just a contradiction in terms. There's a zero sum between the group and the individual and we want to max out our own individuality. And um, I think we need to get past that. And I think that people's experiences can help them get past that. If they experience an act of collective freedom and creativity, an experience that is actually available, um, in a particularly dynamic classroom environment, it might be available. In labor organizing, in activism, in some religious settings. Um, that if we can get people into the practice of this, the practice of collective freedom, um, then I think that there, there can be hope. Um, in terms of the theological relation to this, you know, um, no, no cultural or political tradition is just one thing. Um, theological traditions have a lot that's bad in them, but they have a lot that's really promising in them that the theological tradition itself tried to get rid of, for instance. Um, there are concepts of freedom and practices of freedom um, in Christianity, um, practices of communal life, of experimentation in communal life, um, that are promising resources that we would need to change, uh, change them a lot for our circumstances, but the, the general gesture of them, I think, could potentially be recaptured. Um, and that's, um, it kind of ties back into uh, what I was doing in the conclusion of The Prince of This World, which kind of charts the main line um, Christian tradition um, that kind of gives birth to this dynamic of demonization and of freedom being only for blameworthiness. But there are minority traditions within the tradition, um, tradition minority traditions that were enough of a threat that the mainstream tradition wanted to suppress <laughs> them. Like that might be a hint, watch for something that was suppressed, maybe it was dangerous. Um, and 
um, I think that we shouldn't leave any potential resources for um, creative really uh, rethinking our community community and political life aside especially not one that's based on the fundamentally arbitrary division between religious and secular realities mm -hmm. all right I think we're gonna open up the conversation to you guys um, I conceived the project originally um, before uh, the Trump event um, and there's an article in theory and event that um, basically encapsulates like the part of the project that I did before that happened um, and but as I was trying to grapple with um, what had happened with Trump I found that like my concepts seemed to be helping me and so I only thought of turning it into a full book after the election and I didn't actually um, yeah, so the, like the reason that it's a book is because of the election and like a lot of the stuff with, um, you know, like uh, the racism and sexism and all this kind of thing, like the fact that Trump could happen within neoliberalism made me think of neoliberalism differently. I, I also think an, an important preface to the question is that Adam writes really fast. So <laughs> the argument could go from a long article to a, a concise book quickly in his processing of the election, but then still not have, you know, it's production time at Stanford <laughs> absorbed some of these things that I was asking him about. So this problem of Trump's relation to neoliberalism, of whether Trump is a um, apotheosis of it or a fracturing of it, of whether there is in this very explicit nihilistic violence that we're talking about and this possible kind of jouissance of power, um, some actualization of an older political theology of sovereignty that is a different logic of legitimacy or illegitimacy than neoliberalism's formerly pr pragmatic kind of cloak. Yeah, I think that the, what I've settled on as a way to understand Trump's um, relationship to neoliberalism is that he's essentially a parody of neoliberalism. Um, and Agamben um, says repeatedly that the parody of something is its perfect comprehension. Um, another way from a theological standpoint, um, I would view him as like a heretic of neoliberalism, which means obviously he um, violates best practices in a certain sense, you know, like trade restrictions. Oh my God, we better like get the resistance to work on that. Um, but I think that the heretic deviates from the norm in order to save the norm. The heretic believes that they believe in the norm more than the mainstream people do, and they're trying to save it. I don't think it's controversial to say that Trump's worldview is shaped profoundly by the idea that everything is a zero-sum competition, which is kind of like a coarsened, more obvious version of the neoliberal ethos. So in a way, he embodies it. And I think that he kind of embodies neoliberal culture too as like a reality show star, um, as somebody who just like um, seeks attention for its own sake despite having <laughs> no value as a person whatsoever, et cetera. Um, so I think that it's not that Trump is an old style sovereign, it's that under neoliberalisms we were all incipiently Trumps when we're seeking out attention and approval from people in this kind of um, nihilistic, open-ended way. Um, so, and I think that this is something that I don't know that I can get into in, in great detail right at this moment, but I think that also the racism, sexism, homophobia, things like this, this was already baked into the neoliberal order too, and he's just making it more obvious. Okay, so let's try that. Um, methodologically speaking, and this one may be my fault, um, <laughs> if you are focusing on um, this spiritual crisis, the anxiety, shame, um, uh, blame, worthiness, and so on, um, is that not um, producing an individualistic lens um, for the book, which is a reproduction indeed of neoliberal ideology? Um, and I would take responsibility for having asked you those questions in a way that may skew the book if you haven't read. But, um, and then um, the second question is a little trickier, but about um, the logic of demonization as it um, existed in Fordism or really um, is a product of the transition from Fordism to neoliberalism and are not um, the major antagonists um, of neoliberalism as we experience them now actually um, determined by or shaped by a Fordist paradigm rather than 
emerging later. Is that right? Um, so uh, how do you want to diachronize um, neoliberalism's resistances? So um, yeah, I think that our the first part of the conversation um, may have um, led you to believe there was a greater insight, uh, <laughs> like emphasis on um, the individual psychology of neoliberalism than there really is in the book. It comes up at like key moments, um, uh, but is not really, it's not really my main focus. Um, so I am free of neoliberal methodology at that point. <laughs> I am <laughs> acquitted of any guilt of neoliberalism. Um, in terms of the transition from Fordism, yes, I think we absolutely cannot understand um, neoliberalism, nor the way it's coming unraveled, um, if we do not understand um, it as a reaction against Fordism. I think that um, clearly neoliberalism and uh, neoconservatism mobilized these kind of fissures in American society um, that were kind of um, uh, made more visible through the, the civil rights movement and the, the kind of political activism that was going on in the late 60s and early 70s um, and were able to kind of capitalize on that um, in a way that uh, discredited the uh, welfare state in the minds of, of white Americans and that basically that like I was going to bring up the welfare queen, which you mentioned in your follow-up clarification too. Like the welfare queen is the ultimate um, demonized figure, and the fact that the welfare queen is so instrumental in um, legitimizing um, neoliberalism in the minds of like the uh, uh, white Reagan voters, the the Reagan Democrats, all of this kind of thing. Like it's almost too perfect for my thesis. Like, I was almost suspicious when I realized, ah, yes, the welfare queen is basically a witch. Like, it's, it's, it's right there. It's been staring us in the face the entire time. Just as I think that um, the fact that these kind of, um, the kind of bigotry that we're seeing in a much more naked way, uh, well, is it much more naked? Is, it, is Trump much more crassly bigoted than somebody who would say, yes, uh, women on welfare are all cheating and buying Cadillacs with their welfare funds and they're not really poor and don't really need it and they're sucking our society dry. Is that like worse? Is that better? Do we even want to make that judgment? Has Trump done anything that is obviously, like said, I, he's done like a lot of terrible things obviously, but has he said anything that's obviously worse than Reagan's press secretary making homophobic jokes when he was asked about the AIDS crisis? Like, I don't know. It's a debate that we could have. It wouldn't be a very edifying debate. But this kind of, this kind of uh, casual brutality, this kind of uh, looking down your nose at impoverished and vulnerable uh, populations and thinking of them as, um, as burdens who like deserve what they get, that's been baked in from the beginning. Um, and maybe Clinton and Obama offered a nicer version of it or like convince themselves that it was for people's uplift or something, that they were setting them free from that by throwing them on the mercies of the market. But it's always been there. And again, to go back to the first question, if Trump hadn't happened, I don't think I would have been able to see as clearly that that was the case. Um, speaking of communication technology, the revolution is going to be podcasted. Um, what is the effect of communication technology on the question of legitimacy and in also on the transition of, or maybe crisis of legitimacy for neoliberalism? Um, and one might hearken back to some origins of political theology as a discourse in um, accounting for early 16th century um, communications technology, Habsburg Empire, etc., sovereign legitimation. Yeah. Yeah, I might need, we need to um, have a talk after the, this about the Habsburg thing, but I mean, um, I think that it's a very interesting moment that we're in. Um, you would think that Trump's clinging to Twitter and his refusal to use like the official presidential thing, he needs to still like use like the, the real Donald Trump account and he can't like restrain himself um, and he needs to have this direct line. I don't think that most Trump supporters are following his tweets or are interested in what he tweets. Um, I think that they may view like uh, the liberal fascination with it as like 
maybe like it's positive because it's annoying liberals or something like that. But I don't think that it's the same direct line um, that they think it is. I think what we're seeing is that a lot of like there's been a consistent systematic campaign to delegitimize mainstream sources of information and university discourses uh, for my entire life. And lo and behold, it has worked. But that doesn't mean that it's been replaced by some like um, clear authority, even Fox News. It's um, been replaced by the circulation of bullshit. I think, and the people circulating it, I think know in a way that it is bullshit. But hey, it at least feeds my side, you know, like it satisfies a certain urge. I think liberals spread this around too, um, to a lesser degree. Um, it's sharing your truth, right? It's the responsibilization and privatization of, yeah. of expertise and authority. Right. Um, and even more so the instrument, inter instrumentalization of it. Um, we all are familiar with the ways that right-wingers do this, so I'm just going to point out one that's from, like, liberals. You may remember, like, there was a, um, an epidemic of jokes about how Trump was having a sexual relationship with Ivanka. I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, it probably isn't, um, but like we all just like joked about it and passed it around and like shared videos that seemed to be evidence for it because Trump is gross and we hate him. And so thinking of him doing the worst possible thing of abusing his own daughter feels right. And I think if we can like acknowledge that we've all kind of indulged in that, maybe we can understand partly what's going on. Um, but it's, it's not, it's a vacuum of legitimacy. It's not, there is no, no alternative hegemonic form of expertise or acknowledged um, like real news has emerged from the ruins of of the, the Ford Distorter, which we were still kind of running on like the media machine of the Ford Distorter um, for, from until the rise of social media, basically. There's been lots of enthusiasm for um, uh, populism in both the right and the left, and there are many critics of neoliberalism who would um, f find sympathy for that enthusiasm. Um, so uh, why don't you have that position? Oh, I supported uh, Bernie Sanders in the in the primary, um, and I'm very happy about the kind of progressive blue wave, uh, especially the younger candidates who seem to be pushing even further than, than Bernie. I think that, uh, that a return to Fordism is probably not in the cards, because like, too much damage has been done and too much has changed, and the circumstances in which it arose were radically different. Um, I think that... Um, saying at least Trump is good because he's disrupting neoliberalism is like reckless, nihilistic contrarianism. Every sane and rational person realizes the world would be a better place right now if Hillary Clinton were, were president. There is no case, there is no reasonable case that that, that would not be true. Um, and it just seems like kind of online edgelordism to me. Um, that just doesn't take seriously the gravity of what's happened. Um, like, if Trump would have had a heart attack and died during the primary, I would have said, well, okay, I guess it's over. That was a flash in the pan. Like, things will kind of go back to, like, the already horrible normal. If he had, you know, just gotten bored and resigned during, like, the first six months of his presidency, yeah, okay, well, that was, like, obviously a flash in the pan. But now, I think, after two years of this, like the aforementioned permanently damaged people that I, like this is, he has permanently affected our national life in a probably irreversible way. And there is no way, no way that that is going to produce like a better way out of neoliberalism. I think it's just foolish and childish to say something like that. Um, so that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any notes of um, optimism or <laughs> pessimism to end on? 
Anything you want to clarify or, you know, you get that l'esprit d'escalier of a book when you have a book talk like this? You can I think that the one thing I didn't really emphasize enough because I felt that it was just too obvious was the climate change issue mm -hmm. that in, in a real sense, neoliberalism came at exactly the wrong time, right when we needed to like imagine radically new collective global action on a scale never before seen. Right then is when like all of it was kind of like systematically dismantled and destroyed and replaced with um, this rapacious kind of nihilistic um, capitalist ethos. And the fact that now, um, the fact that now nihilists are in charge and are seemingly vandalizing um, environmental protection simply to be jerks um, is incredibly upsetting and disturbing. Um, and this is, I think this is gonna be a grounds for pessimism. I don't think that crises force you to do the right thing. I don't think that environmental destruction or unprecedented disasters or losing cities or flooding or something is going to force us to do the right thing. Um, we do the right thing by deciding to do the right thing. And I think that there is kind of a fantasy shared with kind of the edgelordism like, well, okay, at least climate change will make it clear that capitalism is unsustainable and is gonna kill us all and then we'll have to change. We don't have to change. Um, and after the financial crisis, the financial crisis did not force people to do the right thing, obviously. Um, there's no reason to think that climate crisis will force it, it will, will do that either. If we want to do the right thing, we have to actually work to do the right thing. I think that's actually a hopeful note. <laughs> Go forth and be deciders. <laughs> Choose to do the right thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks.